Hello, everyone. Um, first, let me thank the uh, Sims Mann Foundation and the think tank for inviting me here. It's really a pleasure. And I must say, it is uh, extraordinarily impressive uh, to see everything that has been done and the uh, large crowd that you, have, uh, that you have here, that we have here uh, today. My understanding is that at the first think tank, there were about a tenth of the size of what you have now, 30 people. So this is rather remarkable. And uh, we really owe a debt of gratitude to uh, the Sims Mann think tank for, for doing this. As a uh, developmental psychologist and a neuroscientist and a member of the National Scientific Council for the Developing Child, um, I've spent quite a bit of time thinking about interventions and early childhood programs um, and thinking about what it is that we can do for children and how we can make these programs effective. So the question that I'm going to pose to you uh, this morning is what we should do in order to make these programs more effective. Because for those of us who study these programs, we know that in many of these educational programs, and also in clinical interventions as well, only a portion of the children who are provided with the educational program uh, or the clinical intervention actually respond positively. And this is actually a significant problem, uh, both in the field of education, early childhood education, and also in the field of clinical intervention. It leads, for those of you who may have heard about the term effect sizes, that's the magnitude of the response that you get from an intervention, it usually leads to very, or to only small effect sizes for a particular intervention, which we start out thinking is very good. So identifying the nature of these individual differences, that is, why some children respond positively and why other children don't respond positively, can help us define and design effective and scalable interventions for children. And that's really the message that I'm going to bring to you today. But really, the punchline is that one size does not fit all. That's really the message this morning. OK. Um, I'm going to talk to you about uh, a term that's used in the developmental literature called temperament. So what do we mean by temperament? Temperament is the quality, intensity of young children's behaviors and emotions. We know that it's present early in life. We know from studies of identical and fraternal twins that it appears to be highly heritable. And we also know that it's stable. That is, that children with a particular temperament, that they retain, many of them retain that temperament over time. And indeed, there's some good reason to believe that temperament forms the basis of adult personality. But temperament really struck home to me um, when I had uh, my first child. So I'm a developmental psychologist. I thought I knew something about the development of, of children and about parenting. And so what did I think when I had my first child? So here, here's who I thought I could be. Now, some of you may or may not know who's in this picture. Um, that's B.F. Skinner, founder of behaviorism, operant conditioning. Remember, he had the Skinner box. Put his daughter in the Skinner box. And I thought, well, this is going to be easy. I'll just follow the rules of operant conditioning, reward, holding back reward, shaping behavior. And pretty soon, I'll have a, a child that will be a happy, adaptive, 
and uh, successful uh, young adult. Well, lucky for child number one, child number two came very quickly thereafter. <laughs> because what did I realize after the second child was born? Let's see if you know who these folks are. So this is James Watson and Francis Crick. They're the discoverers of the double helix of DNA and really the foundation of what we think about as modern molecular biology and genetics. And so I went from thinking I was an operant behaviorist to thinking I was a geneticist. But really, the message here is that it's neither uh, being a learning theorist or a geneticist, but it's really the interaction between the two which really shapes the developing child. Now the notion of temperament has been around for a very long time, just in terms of a lesson of history. That's Galen up there on the top, and he was a physician and philosopher who believed that there were differences among people and they were based upon their, what he called their bodily humors. You had these four different types of people. But in terms of modern temperament, modern thinking about temperament, the uh, scientist at the bottom there, that's uh, Ivan Pavlov and his students, best known for operant, uh, for classical conditioning. Uh, Pavlov was really, and this is not uh, very much of a known fact, he was really one of the first thinkers to talk about individual differences uh, in temperament. Why did he do that? Well, for those of you who remember what Pavlov did, he rang a bell, he had the meat powder, and the dog salivated. And he showed how he can condition the dog. But what he found is that not all dogs conditioned at the same rate. In fact, there were wide individual differences, and Pavlov set out about trying to figure out exactly why those individual differences existed. And he came up with an idea that really, at that time, was revolutionary, that these individual differences in learning were somehow in the nervous system, and that they related between parts in the brain that were deep in the subcortex and those that were in the cortical areas. And that interaction, somehow, Pavlov thought, was what determined whether a, an animal was a fast learner or a slow long learner, a fast conditioner or a slow conditioner. Fast forward now to the 1970s. And two child psychiatrists by the name of Alexander Thomas and Stella Chess had the idea of going to the homes of families with a newborn infant and sitting there and writing down, taking copious notes, and writing down everything that they saw in terms of the infant's responses to a wide variety of contexts. And from that, they really defined what we think of now in terms of the modern thinking about temperament. And they argued that a child's temperament shaped the caregiving environment, that is, that caregivers, moms and dads and caregivers, responded differently depending upon the type of temperament that the child had. They had nine dimensions that they uh, talked about from all of these copious notes. And they also defined three basic temperament types. One of them they called the difficult child. Those were very highly reactive children. One of them they called the easy child. Those were you know, the children whose adaptability was fairly normal and uh, rhythmi rhythmical. They adapted to new situations. And then another group of children who they called slow to warm up. Those were children who were somewhat uh, reticent and hesitant when they were exposed to new situations. But the other thing that um, uh, Thomas and Chess talked about, and it's really a critical concept when we think about temperament and individual differences, is this idea of goodness of fit. 
and I'm going to have more to say about that later on in my talk. But they actually thought that temperament, the meshing of the environment and the child's temperament was what created the caregiving situation that drove the interactions between uh, the parent and the child. And they also went on to talk about how that child's temperament could actually mesh with a teacher's temperament, with an educator's temperament, with a preschool teacher's temperament, in terms of defining the kinds of environments that children were learning in and growing up in. Fast forward now another 20 years to a developmental psychologist by the name of Mary Rothbart. She's at the University of Oregon, and she actually owed her thinking about temperament to students of Pavlov's who were working in uh, Russia and Soviet Union at the time. And she defined temperament in terms of two different processes, what she called reactivity and regulation. And it's really important to emphasize how uh, these two processes really shaped our current thinking about these individual differences in behavioral style or temperament uh, in children. Reactivity makes sense, right? So we can understand that there are infants that vary in terms of their reactions to novel stimuli, to unfamiliar sounds and sights. They startle to a loud noise. And others that don't seem to be bothered at all by different kinds of environmental situations. So we can understand these individual differences uh, in reactivity. But really the genius of Mary Rothbart was to say that temperament not only was there right away in terms of reactivity, but it actually developed over the first years of life in terms of the infant's ability to regulate that reactivity. So their own ability to be able to soothe themselves, their ability to use their attention, to calm themselves down, to distract themselves. These are all things that Rothbart argued made up part of a child's temperament. And so it's important, the message here is that, yes, it's true that all children have these two components of temperament, reactivity and regulation. But all children differ in terms of the development of their abilities to regulate that reactivity. So let's delve deeper uh, about reactivity. So reactivity is a dimensional construct. You can go from a, an exuberant temperament. Those are children that we study in my laboratory who enjoy interacting with other people. They are highly approaching of situations. They smile at you. They seek out and approach other adults. So that's one end of the continuum. But another end of the continuum are those children who we call inhibited. And those children are more reticent. They're more fearful. They fuss when they're placed into strange or unfamiliar situations. They want to be close to the caregiver in these situations rather than go out and explore. And they really take a long time to uh, approach uh, new adults. When I first talked about these children, this inhibited temperament, Stella Chess at that time was in the audience. And she says, oh yes, those are those slow to warm up children that I characterized some 20 years uh, earlier. But what's the second component? So the second component is self-regulation. This is again in Rothbart's schema. So these are behaviors that allow a child to manage their arousal, to calm down. And they are skills that involve what we think about as executive functions. They include long-term memory, uh, working memory, long-term planning, and attention flexibility. These are the things that Rothbart argued many years ago develop over the preschool years. 
and the trajectory of that development differs from child to child. In part, they are a function of the scaffolding that parents provide very early in life, but also in part they are temperamental differences. That is, they are differences that are within the child. They also involve delay of gratification, uh, control of impulses, and perseverance. Now most of you, I hope, have heard, if you haven't, you should, of the marshmallow test, right? Um, Walter Michelle first developed that, and that's a child's ability to inhibit their impulses uh, and not eat the marshmallow, right? Well, it turns out that that inhibitory control that a child has has been shown to have significant consequences for adult health and well-being. So measuring that inhibitory control and understanding that there are individual differences in that inhibitory control early in life is important in terms of thinking about long-term outcomes. But where in the brain are these two components of reactivity and regulation? Well, the first thing is that reactivity is deep inside the brain in the subcortical areas, the nucleus accumbens, the amygdala, and they're present at birth. They are already formed at birth, which means that the experiences that a infant has prenatally when these are developing are going to affect these particular structures because once a child is born, these structures are already developed. How about the brain foundations of regulation? Well, they're in the prefrontal cortex. And you, as you've already heard, the prefrontal areas develop much more slowly. Indeed, they continue to develop into our 20s. And so because they develop much more slowly, they are more susceptible to both positive and negative experiences. For children who are growing up in environments of toxic stress, they're less likely to develop adaptive control because those environments are going to have a significant impact upon the developing prefrontal cortex. So temperament is affected by experience. Reactivity is controlled by these deep structures in the brain. And young children who are raised in stressful and difficult circumstances may become more irritable and reactive, and hence less capable of self-regulation. So, Adaptive development then requires skill building by caregivers. And exactly how can that occur? Well, we've learned in our own research that there are a number of things that caregivers can do in dealing with reactive infants. They can set firm, appropriate age limits. They can help children practice coping skills. And here's the hard one. They can respond sensitively but they cannot be overly cautious in terms of the kinds of responses that they have to their child. How about fostering self-regulation? Well, we know that self-regulation is made up of attention skills, so teaching strategies of self-control, attention regulation, cognitive reframing, reappraisal, practicing Simon Says or red light, green light, all of those things can help a child develop these self-regulatory skills. And it's important to remember that scaffolding, that is allowing the child, creating the environment which will allow the child to develop themselves these self-regulatory controls is something that caregivers can do, and including modeling their, uh, their, uh, their self-control. So I said I would get back to goodness of fit. Let me just say a little bit about that now. The meshing of temperament and environment is not about my temperament is that I'm an exuberant parent, and if I have an exuberant child, then we have a good goodness of fit. No, that's not what it is. What Thomas and Chess wanted to tell us, and what's so important for us to remember, is that Parents, caregivers, have to be flexible because not each child 
is the same individual. We're not all the same individuals. Someone asked me, well, why, why do we have these temperamental differences? And my answer is, well, imagine if everybody was the same. It'd be pretty boring. And so the range of our personalities, the range of our reactivity, the range of our regulatory skills provide a richness to our environment. And our ability to work with infants and very young children in terms of these temperamental differences relies on our flexibility. So let me end with some conclusions here. First, I started out by saying that the real problem that we who study these interventions uh, have is that large groups of children uh, may not respond similarly to the same intervention. And that's because one size does not fit all. Infants and children and adults differ from one another. And these differences are important in terms of reactions, in terms of self-regulation, and in terms of learning. Taking into account these individual differences and the emergence of self-regulation over the preschool and school years is going to be important as we design these new interventions. We need to think about that not one size, not one size does not fit all, and that we need to create flexible interventions that will allow children to express those individual differences. So finally, it's important to appreciate each child's unique temperament. And although temperament is biologically based, although we know a lot now about the brain origins of reactivity and the emergence of self-regulation, it's important to remember that temperament is not deterministic. Just because you have a particular temperament uh, or a child is born with a particular temperament does not mean that that child will carry that temperament throughout life. Parents, teachers, caregivers can help children learn to regulate their temperament and maximize their fit in the environment. And in doing so, we as adults, we as parents, we as caregivers can provide children with the kinds of environments in which they can grow up to lead prosperous, healthy, and productive lives. Thank you.